we just met Rob as our moderator on the panel discussion, but I'm going to quickly reintroduce him here. He's a former Presidential Innovation Fellow and a co-founder of 18F Consulting. Next, he's going to talk to us about Agile and a Legacy Environment. So his question for us is dealing with legacy software is 0% of my business, 25%, 50%, or 75% or more of my business. Please answer and I will read the responses. So 9% says 0%, 24% say that legacy software is 25% of their business, 29% uh, say 50%, 38%, um, say 75% or more, and I'm sorry for all that percentage that I just said and confused everyone. So Rob, <laughs> I hope it makes sense to you and take it away. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, rewriting legacy systems with agility. As it happens, uh, m that's been most of my career. Even when I was in so-called startups, I was dealing with existing systems that had to be rewritten. Um, and I have some, my slides are kind of formal here, but I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to frame this as a story. So I'd like to tell you a story which is true, but not factual. This did not actually happen. It's my attempt to um, explain the way you can use agile practices to rewrite a legacy system using a fictional story which hopefully contains the truth of what it's really like to deal with some of these uh, systems. So once upon a time, there was a boy named Rob, and that's me with the glasses down there, and he worked for a woman named Terry. And Terry worked at a federal agency, and she had a big problem. She had a big black box of software that she believed it would cost $100 million to replace. And this software was extremely important. One of the nice things about working in the government is that your generally have high impact. You're affecting things that affect many people's lives. In this case, there were 10 million people who used this software. And they were very grumpy people because the software was 20 years old. It hadn't been changed in a long time. It had a very clunky user interface. And because it was so old, it was very hard to make any improvements to it. And Terry believed that if she had $100 million, she could rewrite it but she didn't have $100 million. Furthermore, Rob convinced her that even if she had $100 million, she wouldn't want to rewrite it all in one fell swoop, but she would want to do it iteratively, rewriting one piece at a time. So Rob said, let me look inside the box. And when he looked inside the box, he found some interesting things. Now, this is something that I recommend for anyone who has to rewrite a legacy system you have to get someone who can build a map of the whole system. If you can't build a chart, and it may be bigger than an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, but if you can't build a map of your whole system, you have no business writing an RFP to try to rewrite it with government contractors. So in this case, what Rob found were some troubling things, what we might call the mountains of madness, the desert of duplication, and by the way, Rob hates code duplication but there was a lot of code duplication in this system. And there was a critical river of functionality, but most importantly, there was a swamp. And in software engineering, sometimes the word swamp is used as a joke to mean a bug generator. So the swamp is where most of the bugs come from. So the fact that there was a swamp was actually good because it meant there was some possibility of successfully improving all the grumpy people who had to use the software by rewriting the swamp. Well, how do you do that in an agile way? So the way you do that, the accepted way of dealing with this is to um, use what's called the strangler pattern, which I'll talk about later. It was first named by Martin Fowler. You want to wall off the bad part by creating fences around it. And those fences are automated test and APIs. Now, in an existing system, often you deal with problems that no one knows how that component is actually supposed to work. And no one has ever documented the actual rules which apply. However, you have the advantage that the system is running. Therefore, you can build tests that just say, the system is supposed to do whatever it's doing today. Even if it is not the case that those things make sense or were carefully designed. 
So Rob was able to do this. And then he was able to convince Terry to be courageous and say, let's go ask government contractors. And that's this little guy with the hard hat here. How much will it cost to rewrite just the swamp, which is protected by the fences? And the government contractor said, if you've got a million dollars, we'll try to rewrite it. And that's a lot better than $100 million. Now, Terry was courageous, but like many government executives, she was very risk averse because there were 10 million people using this software. And if something got went wrong, she would likely be called before Congress and have to explain things. So she insisted that there would be a big abort button and she, her hand hovered over the abort button the whole time this operation was going on. However, Rob in uh, working with the government contractor, using the fences and the API test that was there, decided it was worth the risk to go ahead to replace the swamp because it would immediately give a benefit to the 10 million users. Now, Terry and Rob had to work with the existing contractors in what is called DevOps or development operations to make it possible to instantly roll back the change. Otherwise, Terry would not have agreed to make a drastic change to a running system, but they were able to do that. So we gave Terry an abort button. If something went wrong, she would be able to instantly roll the code back. So Rob said, lower away, the old swamp dropped out and a new pool was put in place. Well, so this was good because it decreased the number of bugs. And now you had 10 million slightly happier people, which was very, very good. Now, um, Rob, being a software engineer, immediately said, okay, now it's time to get rid of the desert of duplication because code duplication is terrible. And Terry said, well, now wait a second, how many times are we gonna have to do this? And Rob said, only 99, right? We just replaced 1% of the code. We only have to do this 99 more times and we'll have rewritten the whole system. But Terry went along with this for the reasons that Greg and Ann talked about earlier, which is she knew this was a new way of doing things. And she also saw that she had already made 10 million people slightly happier rather than forcing them to wait another year. So Rob presented the following model, which is just Rob's personal way of thinking about this. No one else knows about this or agrees with this to describe the badness of a software system. So in this chart, the, the higher you go, the worse the system is. So the badness is the vertical level and the number of lines of code is the horizontal level. And I assert that the badness of a system is equal to the number of lines of codes raised to the power 2.5. So it's worse than the square of the number of lines of code, but not as bad as the cube of the number of lines of code, okay? Now, how can you use that? It does, that doesn't seem to mean anything. We like, what can you actually do with a formula like that? Well, it means that a 10% decrease in the number of lines of code leads to a 23% decrease in the bugs. And what happens is, as you make even just a 1% change to the system and rewrite it in a modern way, you're decreasing the complexity you have to deal with, which each other chunk that you rewrite. And Chris and I, uh, Chris Cairns and I have recently published a series of, of essays which got a lot of play talking about rewriting things uh, chunk by chunk in order to both finance it and also from a software engineering point of view. Well, Terry was not completely convinced by this argument and her idea, she said to me, show me the money. But the money in this case was the bug count going down and customer satisfaction going up. And she did in fact see that, which was good because she got called before Congress. And so Congress, even though they had refused her request for $100 million to rewrite the system that she was in charge of, called her up and said, how can it be that you have only replaced 10% of this system in the last five years? And that was a very difficult question for Terry to answer, but Rob, who was very good at this kind of thing said, change the subject and talk about the decreased bug rate. And in the end, no one cares about the software. All that matters is the impact on the human users. And because the bug rate had gone down and the human users were happy, this was a reasonable 
um, thing to do. So eventually Terry and Rob got old and they started walking with canes and they'd modularized a lot of the system and had replaced things chunk by chunk. But Rob, who was offended by bad software said, we may never get rid of those mountains. But Terry said, as long as they are sealed off with tests, it doesn't really matter. And that's true. No one cares if you have COBOL running in your system, as long as you're able to provide a good user interface to your customers and move forward with the software. And so everyone lived happily ever after, and the users didn't even know that they had been saved $100 million and a potential flop, as Ann and Greg talked about, from a giant rewrite by rewriting things one chunk at a time. So in the slides, which will be posted, I talk about this in a, in a more formal way later. Uh, so now let me just run through this very quickly. Fundamentally, you have to have someone to read and understand the code. You cannot do this by committee. If it, you have to do whatever it takes to find one human being who can draw you a map of your entire system. Now, this does not mean that um, you have to understand every line of code. No one can do that. But you have to understand how the big pieces fit together, okay? And someone, and this could be done by a small team, has to define the chunks of code that you're going to rewrite. If you, you cannot have an executive do that. A software engineer has to say, look, I'm going to draw a box around this part of the code, and we're going to use that as the first thing to rewrite. That allows you to use the so-called strangler pattern, which has been talked about and named by Martin Fowler, to divide and conquer the problem by creating testable APIs to separate the modules. The testable APIs are very important to decrease risk. What you're doing here is you're not delaying risk, you're spreading risk. Every time you replace a module, there's still risk, but you're taking a small risk, which is kind of what um, and talked about with fail fast and take risks that are acceptable risk. So you replace the system, the system in situ behind test with automatic deployment so that you can roll things back, so that you never have big rollouts and you think of code as clay. Now, um, there's no industry accepted way to describe the goodness or the badness of a code base today. Um, it would be wonderful if we had the kind of rigor with software engineering that we have with financial models where we can do accounting and talk about where we really stand. But uh, I propose something like the square of the complexity model be used to justify rewriting things in pieces to executives. Um, and then I, I don't wanna go through all the rest of this. I don't, don't quite have time except to talk about the order in which you should rewrite things. APIs first, GUI next, persistence, and then finally business logic, because that is a way to provide the biggest return on investment for the lowest risk as you rewrite things using the Strangler pattern. Back over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Rob. That was great. Um, those of you who want to follow up with Rob or ask him some questions can join him in a Q&A meeting room. Um, I'm going to post a link, and to see that, you're just going to need to click the chat icon at the top of your screen. Um, so we'll see that. And you can stick around here to hear Jessie Taggart next discuss user-centered design. Um, she's going to be a perfect follow-up to the conversation we just had about legacy, as she is in the middle of redesigning a legacy system herself. Um, if you decide to go to the Q&A with Rob, don't worry. We are recording these, and you can catch up with them on the website. And um, I also want to give a shout out to um, GovWebWorks, who just tweeted a photo at us. They are all sitting together in their office watching uh, today, so hello. And if those of you who are not sitting with coworkers want to get some personal time with other people here, um, we have a virtual networking room running throughout the conference. You can pop in there for some video chats, and I will post a link. Um, so next up is Jesse. And, oops, sorry, that was the wrong link. I'm going to just post a couple other links really quick. And there's a poll that's popped up on our screen, if you all could answer that. 
Um, I will introduce Jesse, who is a former design and product strategist at ATNF, who worked with multiple federal agencies to plan and build user-centered digital solutions. Before that, she led UX design for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. She's currently director of user research and design at Child Welfare Digital Services in California, where she is leading a multiple design, where she's leading multiple design teams who are redesigning a legacy system using agile and user-centered design principles. And the poll that she's asking us to answer, when it comes to design, my biggest challenge is understanding user needs, getting stakeholder buy-in, coordinating design process with engineering timing, prioritizing what to build, how much to change design from the old system, none of the above or too much of the above. And the results, wow, pretty split. So 19% of us say understanding user needs is the biggest challenge. 22% say getting stakeholder buy-in, 17% uh, coordinating design process with engineering timing, 10% is prioritizing, 14% is how much to change the old design, 2% say none of the above, and 16% say too much of the above. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to get set up here and see if we can get started on this. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm so excited, I think I'm gonna explode. Um, and I have a lot to share, so let's see if I have presenter view. We'll get this going. And then I need to share my screen, don't I? Yes, so Hold green on. button at the bottom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is a test, there we go. I've done this many times. And we will do, I think I'm going to do desktop two. Hold on. Whoops. Hold on, hold on. This is me. I can give a UX assessment as I operate <laughs> Zoom here. Okay. It's never the user's fault. Please remember that. Okay. And then so you're looking at my <laughs> my Slack. We'll just stop that. Um and hold on a sec. Presenter view. You in? You seeing us you seeing the title slide? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so it looks like I have about 15 minutes. Um, I'm really excited to share and talk about this. Um, I've been a designer. Whoops. I've been a designer for about 20 years. Uh, actually, ages ago, doing museum exhibit design. In the last maybe like 10 years, I've been focused on uh, uh, user experience, research, design, and um, working with agile software development teams. Um, and just quickly, like my background related to this is, um, oops, this thing right in there, um, is all sorts of projects related to legacy, different sorts of legacy projects here. And one of them is uh, the current one I'm doing is the California Child Welfare Digital Services, which is I'm excited is a huge like um, proof of concept of a lot of these things we talk about and actually doing it sort of thing. Um, and before that, I was doing anything from um, some strategic assessment on federal projects, Social Security um, and EPA are two big ones, of um, looking at either a project deep inside a legacy situation and the problems that, that have happened, or a lot of pre-planning even before going on to um, assess a legacy system. Those two could be two totally different talks. I'm not going to go into details of those scenarios today. Um, and then before, also, I did at Pivotal Labs, I actually did, a, in the private industry, some legacy um, design projects with brittle front ends trying to fix them without an encapsulation strategy. It didn't end well. Um, <laughs> and also just some, like, legacy just through a lot of, like, uh, developer-only um, building out interfaces versus design being there. So legacy systems in a couple years versus from uh, technology being outdated. Um, where am I now? Here we go. Um, so really quickly, I'm not going to dive deep into this because there's uh, so much written about this better, but this concept of like what is user-centered design even, what is it even? And to really sum them up, it's basically using user, user empathy to lead solutions. And that's basically yeah. understanding user goals, needs, attitudes, um, and to anchor product strategy in how large projects or any project moves forward. Um, there's so many opportunities to invigorate your team and also like how your designers um, operate just through starting with with users because you, you begin and end with that at the end of the day And there's loads of methods and I just want to anchor anchor this talk in user-centered design What I want to spend a few minutes on is talking about what working on a large-scale legacy project. What are you walking into? 
when you have this. And I'm talking mostly for me, I'm like a leading a design team in California. Um, so I'm coming from, you know, professional industry, working with a lot of government folks and different vendors who are all coming together to try to um, approach these projects in different ways. And so some of this stuff is going to be pretty obvious. You're going to hit a lot of debt, technical debt. I, I have a feeling Rob was just talking a lot about business needs debt, design debt. Um, and I, I might, you know, start the dance with your debtors because it's going to be there. And there's a lot of like logistical solutions to be had. And to get to those is going to be about relationships between people. You know, we have these projects, we have these things, but it's how we're interacting with identifying and wrangling and prioritizing all these kind of debt to move forward. You're also going to experience years of resentment from failed past attempts or lack of attempts. Um, and you're going to inherit trust issues, whether you're new to the project or you've been on the project forever. This is a thing that you need to reckon, reckon with at all steps of the way. Um, and it's going to be part of how you deal with organizations, stakeholders, um, your teams, et cetera. And every, a lot of folks are using new methods. We're talking about agile in government, user-centered uh, design in government, and I'm specifically looking at legacy project, projects, large government projects, enterprise-based projects. Um, there could be any number of methods that they're experiencing for the new time. New time. How to like trust and operate daily with agile methodology, how user-centered design um, drives value for those methods to, to ladder onto things, um, new DevOps structures, deciding about open source, um, distributed teams if you have them, um, and obviously modular procurement if you're doing that as well. Um, um, and you're going to have many stakeholders and many users. Uh, many. <laughs> um, and I, one of the things I've said is like, you know, using personas on really big projects like this is a challenge because there's just so many in any enterprise application. And often I'll, I would argue or, you know, suggest that we look at archetypes of types of users, patterns, find patterns between the many types of users, um, or clusters of goals, you know, a supervisor versus someone on the front line versus admin. That might be across many different departments of a large project, but those, those kind of clumps will help you um, anchor uh, design strategy moving forward. Um, and just being aware that there are also many stakeholders coming through many different ways. Uh, to highlight that, you know, we're often focused on building product. Um, and I've been using these overlapping circles probably almost to illegal amounts lately in some of the work I'm doing. But, you know, we're used to building product, but there's, there could be, from, again, from, from 10 years or 15 years of, of this project, there's stakeholder relations, whether deep in government, deep in user types, that sort of thing. Um, in the government sphere, we have um, uh, city, county, state, federal, there's all different levels and fractal interactions of, of that that's accumulated over time. And then this concept, I put it in a big bucket, the first time doing this. Um, this is uh, the, the first time people have been doing this um, in many aspects of professionals coming in, working in these environments, of government folks doing this for the first time. And that also takes time. And there's a lot of org change costs to related to that. You're going to experience this, this it, whether it's implied or, or very explicit, this somehow, can you somehow have delivered this yesterday? Um, and Agile should solve it all, right? Um, one of the things I posit is how can user-centered design actually front load value to help with that kind of a crushing pressure at times. Um, how we articulate these projects and the expectations with stakeholders and knowing the pattern of this will create the space of what delivery means and when. Um, so I'm talking about some high level things here, but it really helps anchor. Um, it will trickle down all the way into your development teams and your design team and your product strategy teams. Um, what's need to succeed? You know, there's an art of this, a balancing, um, there's tensions, what's, what should be a standard, what should be a one-off, how do we learn? Um, I've been using the art lately in a lot of my discussions just because, you know, there are rules and standards we want to use, but everything is not a formula. And we have to really listen to like the craft of the people we're working with in the situation we're at to figure out what method or tool we use and when, not blindly. Um, so some of the things to succeed, I think this is an obvious in, in, in the Agile world, of course, form cross-functional flexible teams. I'm putting a little emphasis on flexible with the cross-functional as well. Um, and teams that thrive on small mistakes. You know, government is a very risk-adverse space. Um, there's a lot of tensions into doing this, and a legacy system has a lot of, you know, we're trying to keep the thing running while we're building it. Um, and we want teams that can actually be uh, acutely listening to that and respond to it. Um, include policy folks and let user research anchor strategies. So I'll talk about this more in a little bit, but policy in government situation and, and also with legacy because they have helped structure what 
business rules exist in, in the product to begin with, should be involved in these cross-functional teams. We're used to this, right, as, a, as you know, to build product, your product research and design and development, right? But I also would posit that there's policy and practice, and policy and practice aren't always aligned. And product is one part of this policy and practice in government situations. Um, so there's going to be tensions between that and to figure out who and where to bring in to help move that forward. Um, a really quick example, it's a small example up in California, is, you know, on the product sense, we were talking with some users about how they're working. And even though they had some online solutions, they were printing out forms, printing it out afterwards and making paper files. And we were like, why? So we're doing like research on site. And they're like, well, for federal, for state reporting, we have to do, we have to submit this by paper. Um, and one of the benefits of working, you know, with the policy folks is to set up a meeting to talk to them and like, well, actually, that's not the case. But, you know, there's been an accumulation of myth of what policy is or isn't. So there was some group is actually working on that right now. And so that will actually have a trickle down and affect what this product, uh, what the features need to support. Um, here's a big one. Where do you spend design and development efforts? Um, one of the most important things is, you know, this a shared actionable vision and working principles, you know, make alignment a joy, I have written here. But it really matters. And I've been saying, like, you know, we always hear about like, vision or mission statements. And, you know, my, my thing is, like, if, if your vision is just saying, you know, making it better for the users, and then it's just a link in SharePoint, you know, about here's the vision, that's, that's not your vision. You know, your vision needs to be something you put on the wall that has a point of view and is actionable. Um, because it helps, it helps drive decision and momentum. It's not, it's not just a, a checkbox as you move forward. It's actually one of the more vital aspects of product strategy. And so product strategy, um, agile is just some of the how. Um, it's, it's, it is, he I'm sorry, this is a little harsh, but like it's headless without a point of view and a strategy of what. And government going into this, there's a lot of understanding, like a lot of excitement about Agile because it's this way to slice up big projects and to, to see it in different ways and to have this flexibility they've never had before. Um, but without sound product strategy, it, it can be a challenge and a risk. Um, this is an example up here, up in Sacramento where I've been doing some work. And, you know, this is product, product strategy in action. Um, and we have folks from all different aspects um, of the project working together to do some, you know, light time box, whiteboarding scenarios and timelines um, and interdependencies. And then we can, you know, obviously relax and go back into the more concrete incremental stuff, you know, sprint by sprint. Uh, product, man product management is obviously kind of related and I kind of in interchange the word with product strategy. And you might be wondering why, you know, this is a talk on design um, and legacy system. Why am I talking about product management? And for me, it's like really good user-centered research and design needs to ladder up to strategy and the strategy needs good product management. There's just too many things going on with the clear um, and the development aspect, all sorts of technical constraints or opportunities that need to be identified and balanced with user needs, um, the business needs, which might be policy and practice, and stakeholders, which could be many different um, uh, things. Um, so really quickly here, uh, product strategy, like a, you really need a, a, a vision with a point of view that's outcome focused with measures. Um, here are some examples, say, from up, up, up on California Child Welfare, you know, ensure the children of safety first. You know, if we put the word first, that's a point of view, and that helps to make product prioritization decisions, which help designers prioritize and move forward too. The second one was an example from when I was working for Department of Labor and their wage and hour decision. You know, is a vision to be to increase time to resolution or is there something else? And then we can start to build um, our efforts around that. Principles to work by. Uh, these are some sa sample ones. You know, are you working in the open? Uh, users first. What are, your, what are the principles cu culled from your, your, your unique database constraints? Do you share your mistakes? Do you hide your mistakes? That could be a cultural thing too. I prefer not, but that could be. Um, the second bullet point, keep the child at the center, connect policy and practice. These are just some experience, um, one's experience values that the design team up at California Child Welfare has been developing um, to help us. You know, it informs product strategy and also design strategy. Um, We're at your time box, Jesse. That was... Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> okay. But the good news is you're going to go to okay. the room okay. next.
Um, so those who wish to follow up with Jessie or ask her questions can join her in the link that I am posting right now. Um, we're so lucky to have a design and usability expert here. So please take advantage of, of having direct access to her. Um, if you would rather stay here, you up next is David Rico, and he is presenting on DevOps and continuous deployment. Um, if you do go to the Q&A with Jesse, don't worry, we're recording. Um, all these talks are gonna be on the AGL website later. And I'm gonna post a link um, and reminder that in order to see these links, you just need to click on the chat icon at the top of your screen. Um, we wanna keep the conversations going in Slack. So if you haven't joined AGL on Slack, I'll provide a sign up link. Um, we also have a virtual networking room running throughout the conference where you can go for live video chat to discuss topics with other attendees. And um, now I'm going to post some links and then I will introduce David. So David Rico is a renowned expert in IT, um, investment analysis, portfolio valuation, and organization change. He has worked as a leader in support of NASA, US Army, US Air Force, and um, U.S. Navy for over 30 years, leading over 30 change initiatives and capturing 1.5 billion in agile contracts. He's a four-time international keynote speaker, and the poll that he has prepared for us says, my customer or firm or organization is planning to use DevOps, currently using DevOps, don't know if we're using DevOps, or are not planning to use DevOps at all. So please take a moment to put your answer in and I'll read our results. 39% of us say that we are planning to use DevOps. 37% say that we're currently using DevOps. 19% don't know and 6% say they are not planning. And Dave, take it away. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, great, great. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, DevOps and continuous deployment today. Definitely get a hold of the slides. I, I hope we can make it all the way through, but uh, we, we may not. Uh, I think Elizabeth did a good job of introducing me. I don't have to say too much more other than I've been about 35 years in the public sector, mostly on the aerospace and the DOD side. I've been in the intelligence community for about 15 years now. I'm in one of the uh, the 16 or 17 IC uh, agencies now, been there for about 15 years. We're one of the big four. Well, uh, we have about a $4 billion annual IT budget. Uh, we're, we're currently undergoing our, our largest reorganization in our 60 year history. We have about, we're trying to consolidate about 300 acquisitions, 1,500 new systems per year into our portfolio of about 12,000 fielded legacy systems. I'm part of the team that's sort of automating, you know, the governance for, for integrating the entire portfolio into one big hole. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Let's go ahead and continue on. I think, in my opinion, one of the, the greatest, you know, motivators for the use of things like Lean and Agile, and especially DevOps now, is, is really the, the subject of scale. Right, I think we have unprecedented scale in, in the early 21st century. As you see from this slide, we, we, of the seven billion people in the world, nearly four billion of them have active cell phone you know, subscriptions. If you've seen the headlines, I believe it was uh, Facebook, so they, they now have about two billion active users. So, so gone are the days when we develop systems for a few hundred or a few thousand users. We, we now have to be able to develop system for, systems for millions and billions of users, even in, during the public sector. You know, I heard somebody say there was a county government that had a million users of their, of their systems. I just listened to a great IRS talk where they used Scrum to, to uh, deploy, rapidly deploy a system for collecting revenues. That is, where people could file their tax returns online. And they didn't realize that what happened was within, uh, after they deployed the system, within a few weeks, they actually had $150 million in new deposits. They didn't understand that just automating the tax return process would actually uh, increase their revenues very, very quickly. So really scale, so we, we have this, the, this challenge is, is the IT community, this public sector, to, to develop systems for, for millions and billions of uh, users and do it quickly and, and cost effectively 
and, and fix our mistakes when 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 we ha when we cause them because we're humans and, and we make mistakes, uh, right? So I, I really like this slide here. If you think of DevOps and Scotty from from Star Trek here, you know Scotty might say something like, "We're going to need some really big warp engines." to move the enterprise at the speed of light. And that's what we were really talking about at DevOps. We're, we're scaling up our public sector enterprises to millions and billions of users. And we have to, like the IRS, de deploy new systems using lean and agile method to, to tens of millions of people. We have to do it quickly. And we have to be prepared for the results to fix our mistakes and, and to collect those revenues when we can, right? So, so DevOps is, it is one of many tools and techniques and, and value systems and principles that to help us do that, to help us scale our IT systems, especially in the public sector, not just in the private sector, not just if you're Google, your Yahoo, your Facebook, your, your eBay or Etsy or someone like that. But if you're a public sector agency like the IRS or the DHS, or, or, or even in, in the intelligence community like us, right? So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but, but we see that, that, that DevOps is, is really sort of an early iterative and automated combination of, of development and operations. People have said that, right? So what we want to do is we want to integrate the work of development and, and, and operations into one whole, the governance, the processes, the tools. So. So what we sort of kind of created division in this community, you know, what really is DevOps? Is DevOps the collaboration of development and operations, or is it the automation of development and operations? And, and I think the answer is yes, it's, it's both of those. And, and I think what, what DevOps, people forget about this, is it, in, it incorporates concepts of lean and, and even agile methods, right? Okay. And when we do this, when, we, when we're able to, to collaborate and work in teams and use lean and agile principles like Scrum and, and iteratively develop our, our, our system to sort of eat the elephant of complexity one bite at a time and respond to change and do the continuous improvement in our retrospectives where we can really see the benefits of, of process improvement. Uh, and when we do those things, we, we get really, really great you know, benefits like business value. We can, we can operate the federal government the more cost effectively, our acquisitions will be you know, more successful and, and we'll be able to, to benefit the, the taxpayers and the, and the public at, at large, right? And, and so we'll, we'll be able to uh, enable both the buyers, that is the government, as well as the suppliers, that is the contractor community to collaborate together you know, to, to scale our, our, our agencies you know, globally. And that's what we're really trying to do. So let's, let's kind of go beneath the covers and, and kind of see what's, what's happening inside the box and see how DevOps works. You know, it really is in, the, in both the lean and agile DevOps community, it's really about sort of in, you know, implementing our requirements in slices versus layers, right? Instead of developing you know, large monolithic systems that take years and decades, I believe the, the, the average length of time of an IT project in the public sector is about 80 months, right? But what we want to do is we want to speed that up to, to weeks and days and hours. We want to be able to, de to develop and deliver and support our systems in weeks and days and hours. And, and when we can do that, right, there, there are a, a lot of benefits. I, I want to talk about all of them. Well, it's faster and we, we get the benefits and it's more cost effective. And, and it's quality. And when we, when we don't do that, when we develop systems in a traditional way, well, why they're late, they take a long time, and, and the value is very bad, and the cost overruns or, or, you know, pile up as well. And, and we see that in the statistics. I, I like the cumulative workflow diagram from the lean community. So when we try to implement extremely complex systems, really, really bad things happen, right? They, they sort of kind of bog down, they slow down, productivity kind of slows down, uh, costs sort of increase, defects sort of increase, and customer satisfaction decreases, and, and contract cancellation also decreases as well. Right? But what we, what we know is when we start eating the elephant one bite at a time using you know, lean and agile principles like one, one, piece, one piece workflow, well, the productivity starts to speed up. 
right? When we reduce the complexity of our processes and our products and our team size, well, we actually see lots of benefits happen. Like we, we get, you know, products out the door faster, better products, and, and we kind of burn down the requirements backlog. Yeah. And we use, there's lots of tools in the toolbox to help us, you know, do these things, achieve these goals. These are just some of them. They're not all of them. We, we use things like continuous integration. Remember we talked about one piece workflow where the developers sort of kind of pull the user stories off our, our scrum backlogs. They, they sort of design our, our user stories one at a time. They, they check them into the version control servers. And, and obviously, they have to write the test. And, and we, we automatically run the test. And if that code, if, that, if the code that satisfies that user story passes all this functional and non-functional tests, right? We just ship it out to the users, right? All million or billion of them, right? And, and, and if it's wrong, well, we have to sort of kind of recall it and, and fix it and start again. And, and DevOps allows us to move back and forth from our backlogs to, to our users very, very quickly. And, and we see that sort of on this diagram too, right? Where, where DevOps is sort of a continuum of, of ideas like source code control and, and build automation and, and test automation and, and continuous integration, as we just saw in the, the last slide. But it also includes these, these latter parts, right? It's the, the release automation and the continuous delivery. And of course, going back to that collaboration, if we're going to you know, sort of integrate, if, if, if we want our developers to be able to, to pull our user stories off the backlog one at a time, code them and test them and deploy them and recall them, there, there has to be collaboration. You know, not, not just from the development people and the operations, but the civilians and the contractors and contractors are involved. In, in the case of the IRS, my, my friends there tell me that, that only civilians develop their, their IRS code. So uh, that would not include too much contractor civilian collaboration. But in our agency, where, where contractors are, are, are very intimately involved in development, you know, I just can't say enough about the, the, the need for collaboration between buyers and suppliers. And we see that on this popular slide. People often define you know, DevOps as, as the collaboration of the development and the, the IT operations community. And you know, we see the terms again, agile development like Scrum and, and continuous integration and continuous delivery and, and so forth and so on. Okay. And, and when we do the things on the last three or four slides, right, we, we sort of kind of get really, really great benefits. We, we know from the statistics that a basic Scrum team is about five to ten times faster than a traditional team, especially in the public sector, right? But when we start using things like continuous integration and continuous and delivery and even DevOps, things start speeding up tremendously. Now we, we start moving to about, you know, five releases per day, right? Instead of one release every 80 months, which is the average for the public sector of an IT system, and when you get really, really good, like a Facebook, right, you're, you're doing about 50 releases per day. And once you sort of kind of get up to the, to the power user level, like a Google or an Amazon, now, now you're running millions of tests and doing hundreds of thousands of releases per day. So I, I don't want to set the bar too high. I don't think everybody has to be like Google or Amazon. And you might not even have to be as good as a, as a Blackboard or, or, or Facebook, but I think we could do a lot better than one release every 80 months. If we can get to the point where we're doing about two to three releases per day, I think you're doing pretty darn good. And we see that in the Hewlett Packard statistics, right? Where they, they were able to, to use these techniques to increase their productivity, but, but not just increase their productivity and reduce their costs. They were able to take all those cost savings from using continuous integration delivery in DevOps and take 80% of their resources and put it into new product development. That is, they were able to reduce their development and their operations cost to the point where they could innovate very, very quickly. And we see the same thing at Blackboard, right? What happened was they were trying to integrate all of their products into one massive code base, right? In about 2010, their productivity stopped. 
And when they broke their product line into microservices and, and started using DevOps, what well, not only did their productivity increase, but but their uh, their innovation did as well. And David, I have to stop you there. We're at our time box. Okay. Thank you so much. That was great. DevOps for the win. Um, if you want to talk to David, you can connect with him in the Q&A meeting room. You just need to click the chat icon at the top of your screen to see the link that I just posted. Um, or you can stick around here to hear Kendra Skeen talk about product development. Um, if you do decide to go to the Q&A with David, don't worry. We are recording these talks and you can get them later on the AGL website, which I will also post. Um, <clears throat> all right. So um, we want to encourage discussion and follow up um, with these talks and with the speakers in Slack. So if you haven't joined AGL on Slack, I'm going to provide a sign up link and you'll get an invite to your email to join. We also have a virtual networking room throughout the conference running. Um, you can meet others in live video chat to discuss topics. Um, and get you know some q a time with other people who are doing similar things to what you're doing um those links are coming to you now and um next we have kendra so let me introduce her the um, topic today for her is going to be setting product development priorities and Kendra was recently named one of State Scoop's top women in tech for 2017. She's a champion for digital best practices at both the government and industry levels. With a focus on usability, accessibility, and empathy, she's always looking for opportunities to educate and encourage others to improve their products. The poll she would like us to participate in says our backlog is prioritized by first come first serve or leadership preference or easiest to hardest or the product roadmap or I don't know or maybe it's not. So please vote and I'll read our responses. So 8% of us said that the, the product backlog is prioritized by first come first serve. 33% said leadership preference. Only 2% said easiest to hardest, 43% said product roadmap, and 14% said I don't know or it's not. Welcome, Kendra. Thank you. Wow, that was great. We had a decent percentage of um, product roadmaps, so excellent. So I'm going to totally switch gears from the last one there and talk for a few minutes about um, strategies for setting the product development priorities. Um, so just a quick Introduction to me, my name is Kendra. I work for the state of Georgia in our digital services team. As a director of product, I manage the roadmap for our enterprise Drupal 7 content management system. So I keep the pulse of that whole system. So I plan initiatives and enhancements, oversee maintenance, manage our training and support efforts, and so on. But more importantly, that means making sure the product we provide meets the needs of our agencies and their constituents. Um, so for context, that system supports the state of Georgia's flagship site at georgia.gov, along with about 80 agency websites across the executive branch and some elected officials. So to do that well, my team has to balance an always growing wish list of features and tweaks from agency customers, right? Like we kind of all see that growing wish list of things we want. Um, but we also need to keep an eye on the changes in device use and industry best practices so we can improve the platform for the needs of citizen stakeholders, those that don't often have a real voice in those feature requests. So this balancing act of prioritizing the roadmap for internal and external stakeholders is what that product strategy is all about. So what does that look like, right? So digital product strategy is realizing that you can't, nor should you, build every feature request that hits your backlog. Now, this may sound obvious, but that means planning a way forward while keeping in mind how that will impact multiple stakeholder groups at multiple levels, right? So from leadership down to the citizens actually interacting with a lot of this. So how do you keep from drowning in feature requests and avoid the pit of reactionary development? For that, we need a framework around how we prioritize that roadmap. To quote the great Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, you can't always get what you want. So sometimes we have to say no to feature requests that would be a huge lift for minimal benefit. So we trade off momentary wins and fancies in exchange for making sure the audience has what they need to access the key information and services that we're providing. It's important for us to approach future requests with a problem first mindset, not solution first. So we seek solutions to agency problems, right? We're not just jumping right in and saying, hey, what module does that thing my customer asked for? 
we say, okay, what's the problem they're trying to solve with that proposed solution that they're providing to us, right? What's the best way to meet their goal? So an example, this is what we hear all the time. We have agencies come to us saying something like, hey, we need to see all of your themes, the skins that they can choose from for their design. Or they'll say, we need a new website redesign. Now, our reflexive response, right, would be to jump right in and to, to a design conversation. Like, oh, here's our list of themes, or hey, you know, tell me what other sites you like. What features do you like? But if we take a step back and we start to ask them to state their problem, usually we find that they're contacting us because they're overwhelmed by the amount of outdated content on their website, right? So that's website content that they manage. They're overwhelmed by the information that's outdated and they're jumping to a design solution. So the real solution they need in that case is a content audit or a content cleanup, right? Not a new theme or a new website. So my point here, right, is let's jump into fixing things only once, once we know what's broken. Uh, if the toilet's leaking, we don't need to start by repainting the bathroom. At that point, it doesn't matter that you hate the color of your walls. You need to turn off the water and get the you know what off the floor. Uh, so for a lot of you, this is going to be a culture shift, right? It's a complete pivot in mindset. It's not easy to break free from that instinct to just answer the question that was asked or to fix something that someone asked you to fix without really probing to understand what that problem is. Um, so in response to a feature request, we need to follow up with probing questions, right? We need to say, well, what was your problem? What is it that we're hoping to accomplish? What's your current process, right? How are you meeting that need right now? And then understand where are the gaps in that process? And then how will we know when we've succeeded? Once you have a handle on that problem, you can start to understand the options for addressing it and chart out the priority for a solution. So what's the severity of this problem? Who does it impact? How many people does it impact? Um, who can fix it? And what's the estimated lift to fix it? So then we can begin to work out a solution and determine where this falls on our roadmap. So we're gonna start talking about, you know, this prioritization framework. How do I kind of figure out what to prioritize and where that falls? Um, we can do something like this for framework for any new feature requests, large enhancements, or bug reports, and so on. So what we start with is, you know, is this request going to help our users, right? The people interacting, the citizens interacting with the service. Does it help the agencies, the ones that are, you know, the business owners of it that are working on this product? Um, is it future focused? Is this going to help us in the long term? And is it going to provide the best value for the time and lift that it's going to require? Um, so a couple of years ago, our team launched an accessibility initiative to improve our platform code and themes to meet WCAG 2.0 level 2A standards. So from a prioritization perspective, here's how that would look on our priority chart, right? So first, does it help the users? Absolutely it does. In fact, I often argue that making, con making code more accessible doesn't only help people with disabilities, it helps everybody, right? We're improving our SEO, we're just making something more usable. So yes, it's going to help our users. Does it help our agency partners? Well, again, yes, anything that helps our users does help those agency partners. And if we're improving accessibility, we're probably gonna prevent some of them from being sued, but they don't feel it the same way, right? Like they don't really notice or care if we've changed it. So we sort of move that back on the list. The next one is, is it future focused? Again, absolutely. When we improve the platform for WCAG 2.0 standards, we knew that eventually that would be the standard, but it wasn't there yet. So we're being proactive and not reactive. And then does it provide the best value? We were able to do a lot of this in-house. We partnered with a couple of other agencies to get this work done. So we were able to do this with overall minimal lift compared to the value that we were providing. So that's what this one looks like, right? As far as the lift for this initiative. So you can see how that compares to another internal initiative for performance enhancements. Again, yes, improving performance helps the end users, but agencies really don't care how long it's taking those end users to load a page. So for them, it's not a huge priority. Um, you know, is it future focused? Well, we're working on it for this platform, but we're going to have to start all over again the next time around. So just sort of thinking about how that impacts. And then you can see how that compares to a design and layout upgrade for our platform. So that's something where we had agencies saying that they needed more flexibility, they needed to be able to move boxes around, they want better control over their content. Not necessarily helping the end users access that content, but more scratching an itch for those agencies. So as we kind of talk through where that falls, we might still decide to prioritize that because if we're scratching the itch for these agencies who are frustrated, that prevents them from you know, feeling like they need to go spend a lot of money to build something brand new, right? We can kind of meet them halfway. 
So this can be useful even if you think through the small requests, right? So every change adds complexity. So even the seemingly small requests may have cascading results. Now the purpose of this exercise is to cut down on the complexity of the process and to distill it to some key goals. So if that sounds useful to you, I've made this available as a PDF that you can download and print and I'll tweet this link and share it on Slack at the end of my talk. So I've got, what, five more minutes to go. Over the last six years, we've made a lot of small enhancements and improvements, um, along with regular bug fixes and module upgrades to the product. But in tandem with those small things, we've also prioritized these broader initiatives with a bigger strategic impact based on the mindset that feeds that prioritization framework that we talked through. So these things, things like making sites mobile friendly, accessible to WCAG 2.0 standards, and improving page load speed and overall performance. Those didn't come in from feature requests from agencies. These were intrinsically driven because we're watching the industry and we're responding proactively to the needs of that broader audience of citizens in search of government services. What's key then is that as we complete initiatives, as we improve on our code, we have to build those principles into all of our future development. Our team has found value in prioritizing these development guidelines as our default expectations for anything new that we build based on those completed initiatives. So this decision is based on an understanding of our audience and our conviction that government is responsible for serving all citizens equally. Right, caps on citizens' mobile data plans or living in a rural area or having a physical or mental disability should not be barriers to access government services online. So we use these development principles to set us that baseline for providing the best effort for access to our services. Now meeting these principles in our product development still requires intentionality at every stage. And our requirement stages, our design, our development, our testing, our content management and training. These are not part of a default mindset for most developers. So if we don't keep up on them as checkpoints in our user stories and development sprints, and if we don't test for them at each cycle, they're going to be forgotten. If these development principles match your goals at all, again, I've created a um, high level checklist of things to look forward to meet those principles and get you started. And this one's just a Google Doc that you can copy and update as you see fit. Um, but again, it's just a way to sort of start thinking through ways to have your checkpoints for principles. So I'm gonna retweet that link as well and share it on Slack. Honestly, then I could talk about any of this all day. Um, I and other team members have blogged about these and other related topics on our team's website. So you may want to check that out as well. Um, and if there's anything that struck a chord, definitely let's chat. Um, and I think that's it. Man, two minutes to go. <laughs> that was awesome, Kendra. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we would love to see the links that you mentioned with those checklists. I think those are incredibly useful. And for anybody who wants to follow up with Kendra, you can join her in a Q&A room for follow-up discussion. And I just posted a link to chat there. Um, or you can stick around here. We're gonna see Rafi Bilas next. Um, he's gonna present on Agile at 18F. If you decide to go to the Q&A with Kendra, remember we are recording all the talks, so you can get them later on the AGL website. And I'll post a link for that. So next up, Rafi, um, he's going to tell us what he learned about Agile at 18F. And Rafi Vilas is a co-founder and former innovation specialist at 18F who loves to share about how Agile can help government meet user needs faster. He has worked on a project to create citizen-centric government applications called My USA and another to make government acquisitions easier titled C2. The poll he wants us to take today asks, What's your primary role on your delivery team? Are you the product or business? Are you the scrum master or a facilitator? Are you a developer or a designer? Or are you not on the de delivery team? So let's see what our audience is today. So 37% of us said product or business side, 31% said they're a scrum master or facilitator, 8% developers, we don't have any designers here, and 24% of you are not on the delivery team. Welcome, Rafi. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to talk a bit today. I think I must have taken a cue from Rob and his hand-drawn slides because I did the same thing. Um, so this is a talk about a, a few things that have helped me in the practice of Agile, in particular, some things I learned while at 18F. I'll very quickly give some background before we get into that. 
Um, once upon a time, there was a lonely designer and developer uh, guy. It was me working out of Starbucks. I was wearing the designer, the front end, and back end coding hats all at once. Um, I was having fun, but I was exhausted. The idea of team delivery was so foreign to me. Uh, there's my little coffee cup and my lone laptop. I wasn't yet with 18F, so that was my mistake drawing that. Um, I kept hearing about Agile, but for me it was synonymous with uh, simply the extreme programming techniques like pair programming and test-driven development. Um, I wanted so much to be Agile, but I think it was mainly because I didn't want to uh, work alone anymore. Uh, but I did know that uh, learning Agile was, uh, it meant getting on a team of people. So I left the life of a one-man show to find a team to be agile with. Uh, shortly after this epiphany, I landed a job at Groupon doing full-stack development. I was able to learn uh, what it was like to actually work on a team and a bit of what agile meant as well. Um, and it wasn't just about pair programming. A lot of other teams were uh, doing Scrum, and it was mainly the source of uh, or that, that structure in Scrum resonated a lot with me, uh, gave me a base for how to deliver my work, and uh, that's how my journey into agility started. At that point in my career, government one wasn't at all on the radar, but I finally had the opportunity to put my technical and design knowledge to use for real in the public sector as a PIF, or Presidential Innovation Fellow, I'm sure you've heard, uh, in 2013, um, but I was still so still clueless about government, uh, that first week I learned that Obamacare and ACA were actually the same thing. Uh, but it was, it was great. Uh, our team wrote a bit of code and contributed to a project called MyUSA, which is a single sign-on solution. Um, and it was uh, a great to be a PIF. Uh, most of my time at 18F was spent as a product lead working on a little uh, application called C2. It's a piece of software that streamlines approvals for government purchase card holders. Uh, I believe its uh, future with the client agency might now be in question, but I did want to uh, share some of my takeaways from being on that team, and I hope they offer some insights into your projects. So my first lesson learned is uh, get it out of your head and make it visible. Uh, making things visible has, has been a big part of uh, my process allowing me to stay in sync with other people as change happens. Uh, Rob mentioned drawing a map of your legacy system, so that's uh, in the same spirit. Over the past couple of years, I've become a huge fan of the Service Blueprint, a collaboration tool I learned through Adaptive Path, um, and it's great for making a complex process visible and is a really good example of how to um, just get things out of your own mind and making it visible, especially when you need to share that um, with a group of people. Uh, with multiple users, touch points, and actions, a service blueprint, pr blueprint gives a structure for mapping out a service. Um, here's what the C2 project uh, blueprint looked like. Um, and quick shout out to Amber Reed from 18F. Um, she is a wonderful designer who helped us create this. And we mapped out the users of the system, the activities, and the system-related functions. We created with input from our team and end users. And so we get shared understanding across all team members and the ability to communicate uh, and make decisions around this system. Here's an example of how we started using it in other uh, instances. Uh, we're using it here to give a status on the different parts of the app. So the, the little smiley faces here are the devs saying how happy they are with a particular part of the code. Uh, we also use it uh, to map out the current state and the future state um, of the application as it evolves. So we would um, take this and use it for workshops and any effort where we're trying to change the actual process. So uh, also along the lines of getting it out of your head um, and more visible, a couple other quick examples is to make it shareable. Um, at a smaller scale, Google Docs is a simple tool to make everyday conversations visible. And at 18F, we were often creating Google Docs just spontaneously at meetings where multiple people uh, could share and um, contribute to a meeting, uh, meeting notes. And you'd be surprised um, how useful this is. Um, I know for myself, moving from 18F to another agency where we don't do this at every meeting, 
you really see the benefit of capturing those things. And we're trying to do that and capturing action items and, um, you know, simply what, what do we decide on um, is one benefit from um, doing that. The last thing that I would mention in regards to getting it visible is making things uh, demoable um, or, you know, do your demos. So at the end of your sprints, make sure that you demo. Um, but um, in addition to that, um, I would really highly encourage people to start using screencasts. It's really helpful to, to, to do that because people don't end up showing up at meetings, they get busy, um, and then all of a sudden you're, you're doing uh, demos three or four times to catch people up. Um, so it's, it's such an easy um, thing to do nowadays on QuickTime. You just uh, uh, record a screencast and um, you're off to the races and, and then you can actually share that uh, later. Uh, one nice story about this is at DOL, we're starting to execute on an app um, that was once dormant and it's actually a project that Rob Reed and Jesse Taggart worked on, um, earlier speakers today. And Rob actually made a video um, of that MVP and it made a huge difference in the understanding of the state of that project as we were picking it up uh, two years later. Um, so that was a uh, a nice little success story about having a screencast. My second lesson is ruthlessly find users and stay connected. So as a PIF, uh, I was given the recommendation to find the veterans of uh, the government and in your work, or uh, shall we say the dinosaurs. Um, not to, meant to be de derogatory at all. Um, this dinosaur is nice and fun, it's got a headband and been through a lot of ups and downs in government, but these are the people that have been around solving the same problems that uh, you're solving. And the command given to us was you must find these people. Uh, for the C2 project, uh, our dinosaur was Anthony. He was a young dinosaur, um, recently out of college, but he was hardworking, but uh, he had already tried to solve the same problem that we were trying to solve um, using Google Docs. <clears throat> And uh, he turned out to be the project's biggest champion. He was well-connected within the agency. He helped us uh, navigate client users. He was a SME. Uh, he ended up being a product owner uh, in the process. So uh, you should definitely find uh, out who those people are. Relatedly, uh, reaching out through your entire network to find potential users is important as well. Uh, when C2 was just a good idea, uh, we intended on getting immediate feedback uh, from people, but had absolutely no users, zero. Uh, the original research was grounded in the insights from user interviews, but those users weren't accessible once we began prototyping. Uh, we fortunately were able to make a connection with a trainer at the agency, and um, what better way to find a target user than to talk to them while they're all going through orientation and training. So we kind of piggybacked on one of the orientation meetings, asked for five minutes at the end of the training session, and um, out of the 100 people, we had 20 some odd people that had raised their hands um, after the demo saying they wanted to help, and they were the first seed into our uh, trusted tester program. Uh, which at that point was just a name. And this is uh, one of my uh, takeaways as well, is it doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be just something that you put a name on. You say, hey, we're doing the Trusted Tester program. Join us and help us to improve the software. And you'll be amazed at how many people would respond to that, um, that officialness of it. My third uh, learning around uh, users is uh, finding those people that aren't exactly enthusiastic about your effort. So these are folks who don't like the change. They're skeptical about the new approach. Uh, like our happy dinosaur, they have been around and have seen waves of change, but probably without any progress. Um, for C2, um, our, uh, our skeptic was Donnie. Um, he didn't look like this, so... Um, yeah, hopefully this, this uh, doesn't indicate who he is, but he, he kind of had the same demeanor um, toward the software. Um, I thought the software was awesome. Uh, he didn't want it. He thought it was uh, a threat to the previous process. And that got our team out of our way of thinking um, that everything was just great and we're awesome developers and designers. Um, and it helped ensure that we were considering someone like him um, in our work. How am I doing? Five more minutes, see if I can crank through 
my uh, last lesson learned. Um, this has to do with taking care of your team, uh, building trust, helping each other grow, and ultimately del delivering good work. Uh, there's a phrase that I've told myself for years now, which is transcend your labels, um, or in the book, Agility Shift, uh, Pamela Meyer calls role elasticity. Um, it's the focus on getting things done over role definitions. Um, at 18F, I learned that ag Agile isn't just about creating product in an Agile way. Um, it's changing the way people do work, it's culture change, and it's process change. One practical way that showed up as we prepared to launch C2 in our first group of users uh, was the need to train people. Uh, we took it upon ourselves to do it ourselves uh, because we didn't have the resources to do otherwise. We took over a training room in the basement of GSA, training dozens of people. And uh, I love the fact that we were all training end users, uh, developers, designers, um, product. Uh, the entire team got involved. Um, I love to tell the story about CM, who's one of our developers, um, and in illustrating one uh, the change of different roles as he was describing how to use the software, he would turn his cap around like Stallone in Over the Top and say, I'm now the administrator. And so I love that. And, you know, everyone kind of had their own flavor teaching, and um, we all kind of went beyond our roles. And um, I really encourage everyone to find ways for your team to go beyond their roles uh, to all of their skills and uh, to, achieve, to achieve the outcomes that you're looking for. Uh, the last thing I would say about this as far as team is to be willing to change the process, uh, be vocal about the process um, and make changes. Uh, for the C2 team, we went through a couple of waves of how we did stand up, for example, uh, from um, online, web uh, three times a week uh, to a daily stand-up uh, virtually. Uh, we also went from a scrum kind of process to Kanban, which was you know, probably a little bit more painful, uh, but it all resulted from having our stand-ups, doing retrospectives, um, and just realizing that the team needed to improve some things. And um, so I really encourage everyone to um, be open to those changes. Um, and uh, in kind of relation to that idea of changing your process, um, use GitHub or some of these tools that do make those things visible. Uh, one thing that we did do when we changed our process from Scrum to Kanban <coughs> is we mapped out the entire Kanban process and put it in GitHub and actually approved it um, as a process so that we knew that everyone had buy-in on that. And that, that worked out really well for us. So those are my three takeaways. Uh, get it out of your head, make it visible. Uh, ruthlessly find users and stay connected to them and uh, build team trust. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Rafi. I think you have a future in slide development or maybe <laughs> turn this into a book. The graphics are beautiful.